I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, Hamas struggles to crack down on drug smuggling in the Gaza Strip. Arab Israeli leaders encourage young Arabs to take part in Israeli national service for the first time ever. And it might be time to get ready for your next hike because a 2,000-year-old road has just been discovered near Jerusalem. Stay tuned for the latest news in Israel. Israeli Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman is in Washington this week for his first official visit since U.S. President Donald Trump took office in January. The trip comes amid a changing atmosphere in U.S.-Israeli relations. The Israeli military chief was greeted with an honor guard at the Pentagon, where he held talks with U.S. Defense Secretary James Mattis. Iran and Syria topped the two leaders' talks. The Israeli defense minister also told Mattis that Jerusalem is concerned over the apparent transformation of Lebanon's army into a branch of the Iran-backed Hezbollah terror group. Both men voiced support for the formation of an anti-terror coalition of moderate forces in the region. During discussion of their nation's shared commitment to stability in the Middle East, Lieberman called on America to take an active role. He went on to stress that the unwavering security ties between Jerusalem and Washington help contribute to regional and therefore global stability. During his visit to the U.S., Lieberman is also scheduled to meet with Vice President Mike Pence and Secretary of State Rex Tillerson. According to the State Department, the Trump administration is in discussion with Israel about holding back on settlement concerns construction in the West Bank. But a spokesman refused to comment on Lieberman's recent assertion that the far right-wing proposal to extend Israeli sovereignty over the West Bank would spark an immediate crisis with the new administration. The White House says it's still analyzing the Israeli-Palestinian peace process to decide its next steps, but is calling on both sides to act reasonably in the meantime. I guess we're just going to have to wait and see what happens. Israel has long been concerned about criminals smuggling weapons into the Gaza Strip to be used against Israeli citizens. Now, the Hamas leaders of the coastal enclave are the ones worrying because the territory is facing a surge in illegal drug smuggling. From marijuana to opioids, the flow of drugs into the Palestinian territory is increasing by the day. Hamas security forces are vowing to crack down on the smugglers, and in January of 2017, Gazan police seized even more drugs than they had found in the entire year of 2016. <laughs> من المواد المخدرة هذه الكمية كانت بالنسبة لنا هي كمية مركزية الهدف منها تخزينها في قطاع غزة لاستخدامها خلال أشهر في داخل القطاع من قبل مطاطي المخدرات so where are the drugs coming from? According to police, Palestinian and Egyptian gangs are behind the issue. The groups mostly move marijuana and opioid painkiller called Tremetol from Egypt into the Gaza Strip. The 45-kilometer enclave is home to over 2 million people, and with unemployment rates at over 40 percent, many young Palestinians are now turning to drugs as an escape. <laughs> حيخرجوا من عالم الواقع حيغير عالم الواقع حيشعروا بالأمان حيشعروا بالراحة حيشعروا بالطمأنينة حيغير كل إحساساته وتجد بالفعل بعض الناس سكارة الذين يتعاطون لترمدون بكميات كبيرة سكارة وما هم بسكارة هم يريدوا أن يكونوا غائبي الوعي عن هذا الواقع غائبي الإحساس عن هذا الواقع in 2014 and 2015, Egypt blew up most of the tunnels that smugglers had been using to shift their goods. Now drugs are often moved inside washing machines or cooking gas canisters, and sometimes even small quantities are catapulted from Egypt to Gaza. In other cases, drugs are hidden inside goods being imported from Israel. Hamas is now calling for tougher punishments to deter the industry. قاتل النفس بوسيلة السلاح ووسيلة السكين ووسيلة الشنق أيضا هو استخدم وسيلة المخدرات لقتل الناس لذلك 
القانون شدد بان تصل الى الاعدام لانه يعتبر هذا التاجر قاتل الناس punishment or no punishment it's clear that many palestinian drug users are already suffering this 26 year old barber inside of a gaza prison is urging others to stay away بنصح اي انسان يبتعد عن طريق المخدرات ما يقرش عليها نهايه لانها طريق نهايتها السجن او الدمار سواء صحي او نفسي او اجتماعي it's very sad Ever since the last U.S. election, it seems like American lawmakers have been divided over quite a lot of issues, but there is one thing they clearly agree on, that the current wave of anti-Semitism must be stopped. In a rarely seen act of unity, all 100 U.S. senators signed an open letter demanding President Trump take immediate action to halt the nationwide spike in anti-Jewish activity. The bipartisan call warns that human lives will be endangered if the phenomenon is ignored. The text is also being sent to the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, and the U.S. Attorney General, urging greater involvement by law enforcement officials. There have now been six major bomb threat campaigns targeting Jewish facilities across America, the most recent of which was only yesterday. The senator's letter blasted the incidents as unacceptable, un-American, and cowardly. They insist the Trump administration devote its full resources to confronting the threats, including federal assistance to the victims and enhanced security measures. Almost all of the most prominent American Jewish organizations are embracing the bipartisan call for action. The head of the Anti-Defamation League says the legislators are demonstrating a unified moral front against hatred and sending a strong message that in our America, a threat against one of us is an attack on all. For the first time ever, Arab-Israeli leaders are backing a plan that would require Arab youth to volunteer for their communities after high school, which happens to be a time when most Jewish and Druze Israelis are obligated to serve in the army. Arab Israelis make up about 20% of the Israeli population, but they have always been exempt from serving in the Israeli military. Many young Arabs don't even want to volunteer in their communities to replace the army service because of the National Service Program's historic connection to the Ministry of Defense. Well, it looks like that's all about to change because the head of the Arab Joint List political party is now backing a plan developed by two coexistence organizations that would help Arab towns establish their own volunteer volunteering programs for army age youth. The program is being engineered by the Abraham Fund and the Arab Jewish Center for Equality, Empowerment and Cooperation and has actually already been launched. For the first time last year, 160 participants volunteered in six Arab towns, including Bedouin communities. Just like in the National Service Program, the volunteers are given a monthly stipend and even a day off per week to study for college entrance exams or study Hebrew programs. Program Program leaders hope that the volunteerism will serve as a catalyst for greater equality between Arabs and Jews. Today, 4,500 non-Jewish volunteers serve in the military, 70% of which are Muslim, while the rest are Christian Druze or Circassian. All right. Back in the day, most of the Israeli army's combat gear came in part from donations from the parents of soldiers or abroad. Well, now a new IDF program is planning on changing that by ruling out what they're calling a revolution. Forget old army slacks, combat soldiers who finished their advanced training will now receive a kit of brand new equipment. From protective glasses to bulletproof vests, the troops will be able to use the items throughout their entire services. I bet you're wondering why this is such a big deal. It basically means that soldiers will never have to scrounge for equipment as they're transferred between various training bases and commands, meaning the change will save a ton of valuable training and operational time. In the past, different units owned the equipment and would have to sign it out to soldiers. Because of that, today almost every IDF combat soldier knows what it's like to waste hours and hours and sometimes even days signing out equipment. Starting in August of 2017, new recruits will also receive money from the Army to buy gear like socks, undershirts, and underwear from specific military stores. The new Army outfitting program is expected to cost around $55 million, but the military says it's worth it because they don't want to scrimp on combat equipment for young soldiers. But for those fighters who want to take a moment, a memento home, there's a catch. All of the goods have to be returned to the Army by the end of each soldier's service. 
Now here's a story just in time for International Women's Day, which is today in case you guys forgot. Here in Israel, both men and women are required to serve in the military. And while only 7% of Israeli combat soldiers are women, that's all starting to change. Tough comes in all shapes and sizes, and the Israeli army wants to make sure that every person has the same opportunity to fight for their country. But it's not only about equal rights. The IDF need all the men and all the women uh, in all that, that, that are able to fight, that are able to participate in the, in the defense uh, missions that they have. And uh, of course, it's also uh, equal opportunities, but first of all, it's the, it's the mission and uh, it's, it, it comes in order that the army will be much more uh, effective. This is where the Haram Artillery Battalion comes in. The unit happens to be the IDF's longest running mixed gender combat battalion, meaning that men and women face off against each other as part of their training sessions. Lotham Stapleton is a physical education officer for combat soldiers, and she coaches all genders in techniques like Krav Maga, the Israeli defense fighting. Today, מדברים על זה לפתוח רק עוד ועוד ועוד תפקידים. וזהו, הצבא הולך לקראת משהו ממש טוב בעיניי. כמעט מחצית מהסד"כ זה לוחמות, מפקדות, קצינות. ככה שלאף אחד מאיתנו זה לא חריג לקבל הוראות מבחורה או קצינה, וגם זה לא, אף אחד לא מרגיש שזה פחות טוב מאשר גבר. According to Israeli law, both men and women are obliged to join the army when they turn 18. Israel's Arab citizens and many from the ultra-Orthodox community are usually exempt from the policy. But with more and more combat positions being opened up to women, the politics of the military are beginning to change because more females are filling up leadership positions. I think that uh, the IDF is very advanced uh, by uh, giving women equal opportunities. We can see it in high ranks. Uh, that women get to high ranks. We can see it in opening more uh, combat units uh, for women. And uh, I think that uh, when, the, when the years uh, will pass, we will see much more uh, equal opportunities for women. But it's not only giving women equal opportunities in the military. The IDF has real needs to fill in, and many Israeli women are stepping in with strength and pride. Are there times when women feel that we are taking them to the mosque? כי מה זאת אומרת, אנחנו עכשיו אה, נגרז ואנחנו אה, נכין ואנחנו נירה ואנחנו ננטרל את האויב. גם אנחנו יכולות <laughs> וגם אנחנו יודעות ואנחנו עושות את זה טוב. וכן, הרבה פעמים רואים מהצד שהם אה, קצת אוכלים את עצמם, אבל הם לומדים לפרגן. הם אחרי הכל איתנו שלוש שנים. הם אה, לומדים מה, האיכות שלנו והם לומדים שאנחנו טובות בדיוק כמוהם, אם לא יותר. Well, it looks like they're doing an amazing job. All right, former Defense Minister Moshe Yalon is apparently in the process of forming a new political party. If he does, it will create yet another center-right party in an already crowded list vying for public support. ILTV's Steve Leibowitz asked political pundit Mitchell Barak whether Yalon has what it takes to make a political impact. Well, it sounds like a great idea, but unfortunately, we're in the off-season now politically. There's no election coming up, so talk of uh, starting a new party might be a little too early because there's no momentum. The problem with uh, Defense Minister I alone, very competent, very capable, very liked within the Likud. I've yet to see him demonstrate a lot of charisma, either as the chief of staff or as defense minister or as a leader in the Likud. I don't see him being able to coalesce people around him. And recently, the uh, reports have come out as who's raised money in financing. I didn't see that he's raised a lot of money, meaning he's got to raise money, he's got to have people that are interested, and we just don't see that. And it may be used right now for leverage for him to join a number two of another party. And although he said he's not interested in that, because he's, of course, a leader and a commander and so forth, that's probably going to be the best option for him. There's so many Likud parties that are sort of, uh, uh, or parties that are on the center right or the right. Fagelin's starting a new party. Bennett's got his party, of course. Uh, there's uh, the, the finance minister, Cajlon, uh, uh, has his party. Aren't there too many different parties on the right? It's all going to depend on whether Netanyahu runs again. If Netanyahu is running again as head of the Likud, a lot of those parties are not going to be able to do well. 
But if Netanyahu is not running and there's a new head of the Likud, then there's a chance that a lot of people will not vote for the Likud necessarily, depending on who the head is, and they may give another party another chance. That'll depend on the criminal investigation? Yes, that'll depend on what's going on now with all of Netanyahu's uh, cases against him, which there are many and there have always been. So it's a little bit early to write his political obituary. All right, and just to touch on the Labor Party, there was this disclosure about Eitan Kabel and Shelly Chimovic, uh, one supporting uh, the other for, for Histadrut and for the Labor Party leadership. What's happening in the Labor Party? Labor Party is usually in disarray. They are having a leadership contest. It still may be that Herzog uh, obviously has a strong position. And don't rule out a national unity government. Don't rule out the fact that Trump is now in the White House. Uh, Netanyahu ha may have an opportunity to do something. And having these right-wing Bennett types, which are really putting a lot of pressure on him, is not the right thing to do. It may be that Herzog comes in, sees that he has a problem and comes in instead of going for a leadership contest. Thanks Today, so 415 million people across the world suffer from diabetes, and that number is expected to rise to over 600 million in the next 15 years. Joining me today in the studio is Erez Rafael, the CEO and chairman of Dario Health, an Israeli company that's created a life-changing product for diabetic people. Thank you so much for coming in. Hi, thanks for having me here. All right, so I see in front of you, you already have this tool that you guys have created. What does Dario do? Yeah. Tell us what this product is and, and how it helps people who are diabetic. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, there are millions of people that are using a traditional uh, medical device, which is the glucose monitor. This is a traditional one. It's the bulky uh, device that have the meter, test strips, and a lancet. We actually replaced this kit with a very small uh, kit that have the three pieces here. One is the meter itself that uh, turns every smartphone to be a glucose monitor. So this iPhone 6 now is a glucose monitor, mm -hmm. and it's not en only have the advantage of a small uh, pocket size kit, it also digitalize the whole treatment and turn monitoring into full diabetes management system. So I, I, I can show you uh, how it's going, how it's working. So okay. the Lancet is here right. and we have here a vial with 25 strips. So I'm going to take out a strip here and uh, I'm going to put it here into the smartphone. Mm -hmm. Okay, now it will tell me to put a drop of blood. Okay, uh, that's the scary part. <laughs> yeah. Not too scary, it's only a zero microliter, so it's a tiny, tiny, tiny drop of blood. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to put it here. And here. Uh, it Are you sure show you want to be showing us this? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, 143. So, okay. uh, everything that a diabetic will need from the food capturing to the blood glucose measure itself uh, to the medication recommendation and physical activity, everything is uh, captured into one uh, cool application when uh, users will have just to carry a very small pocket size uh, device. Well, that's amazing. Now, and, and so this is measuring the levels of sugar that's in, in your blood, right? The, measure, the levels of glucose. Now, in the past, there have been other alternative methods to do this. Like you said, there's a bigger kit, and yeah. in the past, we all had to even go to doctors to do this testing, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So you guys have just completely made it so that this is something easy you can carry around with you. You can use your phone. Everybody carries their phone around. You're never going to lose that, right? Yeah. So my question for you is, what about those who are pre-diabetic, people who don't yet know whether or not uh, they're diabetic, but know that they should be looking out for that? Yeah, absolutely. So this is a medical device and it's standing behind all the regulation uh, of a medical device. It's cleared by uh, European uh, authorities, by Health Canada, by the FDA and so on. And uh, because we created a, a tool that is very user-centric, uh, looks very stylish and so on, uh, and because we have an application, this is something that can be used also for people that are pre-diabetic. Because if we are looking today uh, into the U.S. market, there are 30 million people that are diabetic. Uh, and in addition to them, there are another 86 that are considered pre-diabetic. Uh, and we think that this is also a very big market that people need to uh, know and to understand how to change their lifestyle. So, you know, we don't necessarily want to diagnose them, but we want uh, people to be more aware. And when you have a very small, stylish device, then you can use it, and it's for 
it's for type 1, it's for type 2, it's for gestational diabetes, but also for pre-diabetes in the future. Now that you're saying that, I'm feeling like the more, uh, the better interview would have been to have people in the office come in here and I'll try this out to see how many people, mm -hmm. um, you know, are pre-diabetic because this is a, a condition that affects so many huge, people. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, especially for those who are pre-diabetic, this must be an incredible tool. Thank you so much for coming in. Thanks for having me here. Thank you. Okay, now this is a really upsetting story. The Sea of Galilee is at its lowest level in a century after a limited rainfall last February. Northern farmers even fear that they will have to stop watering huge swaths of cultivated land unless the government steps in. ILTV's Aaron Porras joins us with more details. Aaron? Thanks, Natasha. Yeah, the Kinneret, which is Israel's most important natural water source, only received 10% of its rainfall last month rising by just 22 centimeters on average, as opposed to 60 centimeters in January. The head of the Upper Galilee Regional Council, Georgia Zeltz, warned Agriculture Minister Uri Ariel of the Jewish Home Party that without government assistance, farmers would be forced to stop watering thousands of the 150,000 dunams, or the 37,000 acres, currently under cultivation for fruits and vegetables, and will lose tens of millions of shekels in produce. The rest of Israel has been spared from the drought thanks to five seawater desalination plants built along the Mediterranean coast that pump water through the system of pipes throughout the country. Three quarters of the drinking water consumed by Israeli households comes from those desalination plants. The Sea of Galilee covers roughly 160 square kilometers and is located 200 meters or 656 feet below sea level. It's also an important site for Christian pilgrimages, as it's believed to be the lake where a number of Jesus' miracles occurred, including when he's thought to have walked on water. It's now been 72 years since the Holocaust, and yet many survivors and their heirs are still trying to reclaim their stolen property. Sadly, many have died and others have given up, but now there's a refreshing effort underway to restore one vast art collection seized by the Nazis to its rightful owners. American descendants of Berlin newspaper mogul Rudolf Mosse are now trying to locate thousands of his artwork. The treasures were looted when the Jewish family fled Germany in fear of their lives during the Second World War. What's remarkable about this mission is that unlike many other victims, the family is actually being assisted by several German public institutions. The enterprise is being described as one of the largest art restitution projects in history. The invaluable collection consists of paintings, sculptures, books, antiquities, and furniture. The German bodies cooperating in the search include the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation, the German Lost Art Foundation, several art museums and the Free University. In fact, an art historian at the university is even enlisting her students to help find and identify the missing works. One of the Moss Hairs is expecting hope this undertaking can set an example of how families and institutions can work positively together. So far, only a few dozen pieces of the collection have turned up, but the family is looking forward to the possibility of displaying the retrieved art in a public exhibition if and when the magnificent collection is more complete. Complete. All right, here's some more exciting historical news. Archaeologists have just discovered a 2,000-year-old emperor's road in Beit Shemesh, which is just 20 miles west of Jerusalem. And that's not all. They even found a set of ancient coins. ILTV's Aaron Porras is back in the studio with more. Aaron, tell us the details. All right, well, this ancient, wide, and well-preserved 2,000-year-old road dates all the way back to the Roman period. Let's take a look at uh, my report and see more. It was discovered last month during excavations carried out by the Israel Antiquities Authority. On Tuesday, the director of the excavation, Irina Zilberbad, said that the road had been close to six meters in width and stretched for roughly two and a half kilometers. Zilberbad was quoted as saying, quote, The road was apparently built to link the Roman settlement that existed in the vicinity of Beit Nathif with the main highway known as the Emperor's Road and that the road served as a main artery connecting several large settlements of Eleutheropolis or modern-day Bet Guvrin and Jerusalem. She went on to say that, quote, during the Roman period, as a result of military and other campaigns, the national and international road network started to develop in unprecedented manner. The Roman government was well aware of the importance of the roads for the proper running of the empire, end quote. The Hebrew word of the day is brought to you by the University of Haifa, Hebrew Summer Ulpan, open to everyone. And now for our Hebrew word of the day. While many new Hebrew words are coined every year, today's word of the day is a pretty old one, even older than the Roman emperor's road recently discovered in Beit Shemesh. 
The word is Rechov, meaning road or street. Aside from getting you to where you're going, Rechovot or roads are also a great way to honor important figures. That's why here in Israel, it's rare to enter any city without a Rechov Herzl, Rechov Ben Yehuda, Allenby, or Rechov Ben Gurion. Israel may be the startup capital of the world, but lacks creativity when naming new Rechovot. The good news is that you don't need to know the names anyway, as Israeli directions are typically along the lines of Yashar, 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 meaning straight, 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 then right. Maybe that's why it took the Jewish people 40 years to get through the desert. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be windy but pleasant with a low of 56 or 13 degrees Celsius. You can expect tomorrow to be sunny with clear skies and a significant rise in temperatures to a high of 86 or 30 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.68 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV. Thanks for watching and see you next time.